Senate Judiciary Committee um, <clears throat> meeting on uh, Tuesday, whatever it is, June 17th, I guess. Um, and our first witness is our last witness from last week. Um, oh, why can't I pronounce your name? It's really it's fine, not. Senator. It's, it's, it's my, Han Nathred and Longo. <laughs> it's the executive director of the. Um, oh God. No, I, I, I'm the uh, chair of the racial disparities. Chair of the, the racial board. disparities board, and thank you for being here again. And Absolutely. <clears throat> we're going to continue your testimony from last week, and then hear from some other folks. Okay, I, I was. I have to confess, things are moving so very quickly that I have heard that S219 has morphed into a concatenation of 219, H464, and two, uh, 808. I have not seen those. So in a strange sense, I'm here not having done my homework. Well. Um, and that's fine. It's it's there is a draft available on our website on the committee okay. website, and I don't know the numbers that you just recited, but we do have a section banning um, the use of uh, chokeholds, right. requiring the use of body cameras, right. and um, dealing with uh, deadly force similar to California law, right. Um, I'm, so those are the main sections along with the original racial data collection okay. penalty for failing to do what you're supposed to do. Okay. I'm going to ask, if there is someone else <laughs> online who is actually prepared, I would recommend that you go to them right now and give me a few moments to confer okay. with some other members of the RDAP. Because be I did great. not present this. It's it's okay. on the the draft is on our web page committee page for today, and I will go there right now. I'm I beg your indulgence. Uh, this is all a, a new problem. thing for me. Not a problem. Why don't we go okay. to James? Why don't we go to James Pepper right now, um, since he's available, uh, representing the Department of State's attorneys and sheriffs. Okay. Thank you very much. James Pepper, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Um, I'd just uh, like to thank the committee for taking this bill up and prioritizing it. Um, I want to thank all the witnesses that have spoken today um, and all the advocates and witnesses that have honestly been working tirelessly um, behind the scenes, not just in the preparation of this bill, but for years now. Um, I would just mention, you know, Eitan, uh, Dr. Nasred and Longo uh, conducted our last racial disparities panel from a hospital room awaiting surgery. Um, and that's when we reviewed the kind of earlier draft of this bill. Um, so it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of, I have a lot of gratitude for, for the work that he's done over the last years chairing our racial disparities panel. Um, so on, I would just, if I could quickly just at the beginning, just mention just, that you know, through my work on the racial disparities panel, it just becomes so obvious when you look at indicators like incarceration rates or COVID deaths or differences in average wealth, employment, underemployment, school suspension and expulsion rates, healthcare outcomes, um, and the list goes on and on, um, that we live in a system where racial inequality um, and racial prejudice is built into the foundation of it. Um, that's something, I mean, Vermont is certainly not immune from that, from that fundamental fact. Um, and with respect to remediating um, institutionalized racism, I think police use of force and S219 is a good place to start. Um, it's certainly where the kind of rubber meets the road when you think about, you know, the collateral consequences and at times deadly consequences that we've seen unfold across the country and in our own state. So, and I can't stress enough that public confidence in law enforcement is crucial um, and foundational to 
community-based policing, which is kind of the cornerstone of a modern police force. And um, this bill, I think, will fundamentally help build confidence in our system. So as Dr. Nasreddin Longo mentioned, uh, this bill is evolving very quickly. Um, I haven't had a full opportunity the way that I normally would to vet it through the state's attorneys. They, have all, they all know the basic principles behind it, but I'll do my best to kind of um, testify from, the, from my experience with the racial disparities panel and in speaking with the state's attorneys that I have been able to talk to about this bill. I'd like to start with some of the later sections of the bill and then move to the earlier sections, if that's all right. Um, sure. So I would start with section six. This is the new crime that's being created, um, mm -hmm. the law enforcement use of improper restraint. So I, I, I would just say, I'm not sure that this is actually necessary, although we don't oppose it. Um, police fundamentally are not trained to use restraints that cause serious bodily injury um, or death. And so these are gonna be crimes already. And, um, you know, whether, you know, I'm just looking at the proportionality of this crime compared to the ones that we would normally charge in those instances where ser serious bodily injury or death result. You know, an aggravated assault is a 15 year fel felony, manslaughter, 15 year felony, first degree murder, 35 to life, second degree murder, 20 to life. Um, I would note that this crime doesn't contain an intent element. So a prosecutor may just default to the crimes that are already in existence. It might just be easier um, when you're thinking about whether this was done neglig criminally negligently or whether it was an intentional act. Um, certainly there's an aggravating factor here, which is that, you know, the police are using their capacity as a law enforcement officer where, you know, a person, um, you know, they, they have a disproportional force um, over a, in a, uh, the person that they're trying to detain or that they're using the, this force against. So I, I understand the, the kind of basis for this crime, um, but I, I, I'm just not sure it's totally necessary. You know, one May I ask you a question? One thing, um, Senator Sears, that you mentioned. Oh, sorry. Matt, Was there a question? Uh, yeah, my questions are regarding the intent. I think that the section provides, you know, I like the section, but if you think there needs to be an int some kind of intent embedded in it, that, that that I would ha would be happy, happy to hear some suggestions. Um, I'm also wanted to make clear that it's in the process of a restraint where the crime would occur. Correct. Um, right. Employs a prop improper restraint that causes serious bodily injury right. or death. That's right. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, I I don't I guess I don't see the difference whether the person intended it or not. So, in other words, it they're they're cutting off somebody's wind or blood to the point where it causes serious bodily injury. Do we need to to worry about intent at that point? Um, I mean to provide a defense where somebody could say, well, I was just trying to restrain them, not to injure them. I would imagine everybody would say that, but the point is that they used an illegal restraint and they caused serious bodily injury. So I, I don't know, it, it seems like we would just be, um, I don't know, look, looking for a way not to redress the crime at that point. I guess I would ask the witness that question. I, I was going by what he said on that. Yeah, no, it, it is a question for James. Yeah. So I guess in some ways, what, what you're saying is this is a, a strict liability crime where if you've done it, it doesn't matter what your intent was. And I guess that does make this different than the other crimes that I mentioned, um, the, uh, the aggravated assault, the manslaughter. I mean, generally speaking, you know, the greater, you know, the more specific your intent, the greater the penalty. Uh, when these situations that result in death. But um, if that, you know, if that's the way the committee wants to go, then I, then I think 
yes, this this would be a, a no intent crime where if you've well, done this, then uh, then regardless of what you're, I mean, if you've used an illegal chokehold and the person had serious bodily injury or death resulting, then it doesn't matter what your intent was. So I think as long as it's clear it was in the in the uh, use of restraint, if a police officer were being um, attacked by a person that they were trying to place under arrest and that person and then that gets into a for lack of a better term, talk about a wrestling match, that would be a little different. That was not an attempt to restrain the person all of a sudden attacks the police officer. So as I see it, would that be a different situation? Is it clear that that would be a different situation? If uh, it, uh, can, I, can I, it isn't to me because if you're doing it, you're doing it in in this case I, but james would know better but it seems to me that if you're if you get into a wrestling match you are trying to restrain the person no that, i'm my my description is yeah. of the police officer and there have been cases where police officers have been attacked by particularly in domestic violence cases right not in and um you know we're we all know of them um and i'm a question as long as it's clear that the it seems well it seems like the intent element should be if you're intentionally employing an improper restraint and that might remove it from this idea that you're in a scuffle and the police officer maybe um, puts your arm in a way that they they haven't been trained to do, or or might be considered an improper restraint. Right. Let's move on. Yeah. Then. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, but if you could give some thought to that, Pepper. But we now on Friday, it's where we're headed. Okay. Yeah, I, I will. I, I think that that's important, and remember that is a recommendation from the sentencing commission that whenever a new crime is created, to to make the the intent element, if you want it there, if it's not a strict liability crime, clear, um, so that it's clear to um, the officers and the prosecutors and the people that are reviewing these cases, um, what, what's intended. And with respect to that, I just wanted to point out something, Senator Sears, that you mentioned before in prior testimony that um, what is absolutely critical is who is doing this review when there is mis police, alleged police misconduct, um, how that, uh, review is being conducted, who is making the charging decision, and who ultimately is prosecuting the case. Um, as this is certainly for a different bill, so I won't go, I won't belabor the point. Um, but, uh, you know, in practice, there is an independent review done by the Attorney General's office and the state's attorney in the county where the incident occurred. But if charges are brought by the state's attorney, they are very often conflicted out of that case because of the pre-existing, the working relationship with the law enforcement officer. And um, so, you know, there's a number of proposals that the state's attorneys are looking at currently in order to kind of give a more, I guess, independent investigation um, in even looking at conduct that falls short of criminal, you know, um, and, and also how to, uh, initiate decertification. I think those are issues that the, that the state's attorneys are very interested in, in exploring. And perhaps that's for a different bill. Mr. Chair, yep. before we move on from this section, I just wanted to respond to the, to the idea that it's not necessary. Um, and my thinking here is uh, we have had law enforcement come to us uh, as well as the firefighters come to us and ask us to create crimes specifically around injuring or killing a law enforcement officer or a firefighter. And so those take on their own additional significance. So aggravated um, murder of a firefighter we just passed. And the intention behind creating the crime is to create an effect that people understand it's, it's, an, it's a very uh, you know, major thing to commit this sort of violence on someone in uniform. 
I view this as the reverse. This is a crime that is saying specifically how important it is for law enforcement not to use this particular form of restraint to the point where a crime has been created um, to enshrine it in law. Um, so that I think is something we shouldn't we shouldn't overlook. We have we have already in certain ways privileged law enforcement in the criminal statutes. This is a way of uh, providing uh, a kind of necessary restraint in almost a balancing fashion. If I could just kick in there, Dick, I, I'm, I'm hearing where Philip wants to go there. I'm also a little bit concerned when you define this as a strict liability crime, traditionally an individual has the right to repel force against them, whether they're in uniform or not, based on the theory of self-defense. And James, as you're looking into this for Friday, I would just ask you to consider in a strict liability situation, are we muddying up that normal theory of self-defense? Yeah. Because I'm, I'm concerned that if somebody in uniform is being attacked, and the only way they have to defend themselves in that moment in time is to use a chokehold, I'm not sure that I want to have them guilty of a crime automatically without the ability to say, wait a minute, the only way out of the situation I was in to prevent myself from being killed was to use this particular manner of defense. So I just, James, I just want you to float that around in your head and hopefully give it some thought. But if, if we pursue this line of thinking, what we're saying is we're not banning chokeholds. So we're either banning them or we're not. If we say it depends on the officer's perception of risk to themselves, then we're back where we started. But that's a question for the jury as to whether or not they had that opportunity. Yeah. We're, we're on a really tight timeline. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Sheriff Anderson, we're not gonna take questions short. You'll be given a chance in a few minutes to speak. Um, I, I wanna, we've raised an important issue, I think that needs to be resolved. And I, um, I'm concerned with how this is, I, I wanna continue this conversation, but uh, Pepper, you have quite a few, do other things you wanted to get to or? I'll try and be as brief as I, I, would, I mean, in some ways, the other witnesses are, are much more important than, than our testimony. No, no, no. I didn't but, mean that. Okay. Um, okay, well, I'll, keep, I'll move on then. Um, so section four, um, so I would just say with respect to uh, section four, the essays have not been involved in the evolution of H808 or 646 or 464. Um, but, you know, the principles that are here that deadly force, and I'm summarizing the way that I'm reading them, um, that deadly force be necessary, that it be that use of force be proportional to the harm posed, and that there's a duty to intervene from other enforcement officers. There, these are all, you know, the, we support these. I mean, the, these, these um, in my experience as someone who reads police affidavits for a living, the law enforcement officers that I know are operating under these standards already, albeit informally um, in this state. Um, and if there needs to be a formalized uh, stating of these, you know, the state's attorneys are okay with that. Of course, you know, what we've been dealing with with the racial disparities panel is a much more insidious problem, which is how do you eliminate racial bias, both implicit and explicit, that are leading to these disparate outcomes in our incarceration population and the others that I that I noted, um, you know that that is a much more nuanced uh, discussion and, and and one for an, another day. But I would just mention that we we started to deal with that in our racial disparities um, report. Um, with respect to body cameras, you know I think that's kind of a no brainer. I, I you know I recognize that the issue that, that Senator Benning raised the other day, which is, you know, the guy or the woman who's a law enforcement officer filling out paperwork and then all of a sudden a crime occurs uh, in their barracks. And, you know, maybe they didn't turn their camera on at that time. But, you know, I think that for the most part, uh, this, um, you know, as long as, you know, 
police should be, their body cameras should be on and running um, whenever they're engaged in their duties. So we certainly support that. Um, the, uh, the, the sections one through three, this, this will be my last comment. This is on the data collection. Um, the, um, so the, the state attorney strongly support data collection and the timely dissemination of uses for of use use of force, as well as just every high impact, high discretion decision point, starting mm -hmm. from that initial police encounter through the time the person is no longer in state custody. Um, the racial disparities panel, Justice Reinvestment Working Group, spent a great deal of time dissecting and understanding the state of data collection in in Vermont, and um, we came up with recommendations very similar to um, this. And they were unanimously supported by all members of our racial disparities panel. Um, the one note of caution is that you know we spent uh, one of our one of our meetings. We spent two hours with Stephanie Seguino, the UEM professor who authored uh, "Driving While Black and Brown in Vermont." And um, the big takeaway from that was that the quality and consistency of data that's being collected right now is highly variable. Um, by way of example, she showed us eight different ways that law enforcement agencies are coding um, uh, Native Americans. Um, some use I for indigenous, others use NA for Native American, some use FA for first Americans, et cetera. Um, there are also Departments use, sometimes they code one stop as a single event. Sometimes if there's one stop with multiple outcomes, for instance, someone was pulled over and they're given a ticket and then they're arrested or they receive multiple tickets. Sometimes that's reported as you know several different incidents. Um, so my only point with mentioning all that is that you know without consistency across the state, um, then you know we certainly run the risk of drawing inaccurate conclusions. Um, and you know when law enforcement codes something one way, the state's attorneys code it a different way, and then the courts code it a different way, and then Department of Corrections codes it even a different way. Then you know we have no ability to track that one case throughout the entire system. And so I I would just note that I really appreciate the approach that's taken in the Justice Reinvestment Bill which says everyone needs to get together, including members of the public, decide what an incident is, decide what the definition of race is, decide what the definition of a case is, and track it consistently from one stop on the criminal justice system to the next. Um, and also determine what resources are necessary in order to do that effectively. So with that, I, I'm happy to take questions um, and, um, yeah, I just want to thank the committee again for, for prioritizing this bill. Any questions? Pepper. Pepper, thank you very much. I do have a couple of questions that I'll hold on the quality of the data, but I agree totally with what you have said. It was clear from the Justice Center that their inability to get certain information um, made it very difficult for them to make certain recommendations that they might otherwise have been able to do. And the whole differences between state's attorneys, Department of Corrections, the courts, mm -hmm. local law enforcement and collection of that data makes it very difficult. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, we'll go to Julio Thompson now. I don't see. Julio, are you there? I am. I am. Good. Well, we pick up with you. Um, If you wanted to add to your testimony from last week, uh, before I do that, I just want to make sure that I was that I have the the latest version of the bill. <coughs> the version I had was version one point two that was circulated. June that is 20. the latest version. Yep. Okay. Well, I think we mentioned uh, I mentioned before that we support H eight hundred eight. I think the the discussion that I've been hearing about per se liability, I think, does require. Um, does require some thought. Um, there are, uh, and there are people in the room here on, on and off the committee that know that there are certain due process um, rights um, when you're talking about a criminal sanction for something where 
um, the person's actions may have been completely unintentional. It could be, for example, um, I, I think what, when the language, and I don't have the answer today, but I, I, I agree that it requires some thought um, because if an improper restraint might be something that could for any period of time, you know, affect someone's neck and then cause substantial injury. The injury may not have to be a neck related injury. It could be, for example, that in a melee, someone uh, executes a, a headlock that's poorly executed and their arm crosses a person's windpipe briefly. And then the two tumble down a set of stairs and the person, uh, the, uh, the civilian suffers an injury that might be substantial bodily injury, but that has nothing to do with asphyxiation or strangulation or loss of blood to the brain. It might be that the person suffers a, a long-term injury to their hip or their leg. Um, so if that's intended to, to be captured in the statute, um, that's one thing, but if it's not, then probably some careful uh, language would be, uh, would be needed uh, for that. So I think that that's an appropriate area a focus. Uh, our, our view about uh, use of force, and just to follow up from last week, is that that reasonable, necessary, operational standard um, shouldn't be confined um, just to deadly force, but should be used for all um, force. It's not a novel standard. Like I said, it's some departments have been doing it for the better part of the last decade, like Seattle, um, uh, Cleveland, New Orleans, um, and. and fundamentally um, putting resources into training on de-escalation. Um, experience has shown in other agencies where they have provided those re resources in escalation or de-escalation results in fewer shootings, fewer in custody deaths, fewer complaints, fewer lawsuits, fewer injuries to officers or officers who are disabled as a result of a close quarters um, fight and uh, fewer overall um, uses of force, particularly um, in predictable um, scenarios, usually a person who's in crisis either um, related to uh, a substance uh, abuse disorder or mental health issues. Um, slowing the incident down um, keeping distance whenever possible, explaining your purpose and so forth um, really helps. It's really tactically sound for the officers. Um, and I think that um, uh, for the, uh, the, the larger police forces where there's more likely to be more prompt backup, embracing what's called a team policing model that you, um, you generally, the default would be that um, if it's practicable to have a second officer, the officer there to place someone under arrest, you don't do a solo officer arrest because um, if there's any kind of resistance, the officer may quickly have to escalate force either to defend themselves or carry out the arrest, where sometimes the presence of a second or third officer um, communicates itself to the, to the a person who's going to be arrested, that fight is probably not going to be that productive. So I think that is um, very powerful. And I think the when we're looking at policies, we support in other jurisdictions that have done this uh, and made progress would make a, have policies that hold a officer accountable for failing to de-escalate, even if the force that they use ultimately. Um, would be justified under the use of force policy. If an officer escalates and provokes or enters into a situation where any reasonable person in the officer's situation would have to fight their way out because the other person became assaultive. But if the officer had opportunities to de-escalate or indeed escalated unnecessary, um, those officers should, you know, if, if they had an opportunity to do it and didn't follow their training and policy, then they would be accountable for that. Um, that's a critical distinction because usually and historically the focus has only been on the use of force by an officer when it happens. At the time the officer 
swung uh, their fist or used or deployed pepper spray rather than the events, the decision-making process that leads up to that. Um, when, it, when it's clear to officers that they're expected to plan ahead and use critical thinking when time permits, um, then they'll have more positive results for themselves and they'll know that if they don't plan and just rely on impulsive actions or you know, just aren't thinking ahead and following their training and coordinating with their resources, then um, they're more likely to have more close contacts which place them, themselves or others at risk. Right. If there are any questions, I'm happy to respond to them. Yeah. And you're suggesting that use of force, excuse me, the use of force standard in sections four, I think it's four, um, be extended to all use of force, not just deadly force. When we're talking about the fundamental requirement that force be reasonable, necessary, and proportional to the circumstances, I think, oh, yes. So would that, and I'm, and I'm, um, Maybe stating the obvious, um, I'm thinking of the two most recent horrid deaths of um, African Americans by uh, police. The one in uh, Minneapolis was a counterfeit, an alleged counterfeit $20 bill. Um, the one in Atlanta was, an, I guess, an alleged DUI. Um, because the person had blown um, over the legal limit. <clears throat> to me and to any normal, uh, I, I, any person would see those as minor offenses, uh, maybe the DUI more serious in potential future consequence. However, um, certainly, um, other ways to deal with that. They had the vehicle. They, he had offered the keys. He had offered to lock the vehicle. So I guess taking those two examples in your use of force, uh, let's hope that there wasn't deadly force. Any use of force, how would you describe any use of force in either of those? Well, there are all sorts of uses of force, for example, um, that can happen at any point in an encounter. One can be um, contact controls when you're putting your hand on somebody and you are uh, trying to get them, let's say, to um, you want to be, you, you have authority to arrest them. An officer might use a wrist lock, so they bend the wrist in a certain way that makes it painful for that person to jerk their hand away. That would be a use of force. Now, it's very fact specific. I think there are plenty of people in the room who either know this from practice or just common sense. So if you're using a, a, a wrist lock on an 11 year old shoplifter who stole uh, a Hershey's kiss, you know, that was observed by an officer in the store, that, that may not be uh, proportional or reasonable uh, to apply force given the nature of the offense and the sort of resistance one would expect from, uh, you know, from a young child. Then you could change the arrestee uh, and, and the officer size. So it has to be proportional to the threat uh, and right. to apprehend the person without delay. I, I don't feel comfortable going into all the details of the two incidents you give them because I'm not sure I have them all. Right. Um, and, you know, like I think it came out, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it came out in the Minneapolis case, for example, that the, um, that the officer uh, knew Mr. Floyd uh, and I think may have actually had prior contacts with him so in cases where you have a property related or a nonviolent offense and the officer or the department knows where to get the person if they flee, um, if there's no danger presented, um, that may affect the reasonableness of, of force that's used um, to arrest that person. Um, so uh, I, I think what, when we're talking about all uses of force, um, when, when you're talking about necessity, Necessity. The question um, becomes: What uses of force would, uh, if you're going to say deadly force has to be necessary, but a taser doesn't have to be necessary? The pepper spray could be disproportionate to the circumstances. It's a little anomalous. 
That's why um, when that standard, that reasonable, necessary, and again, the word proportionate or proportional has been used, it's been applied consistently to all uses of force. Uh, I think I testified earlier, Seattle did that in um, 2013 and haven't asked to change the standard, even though under the consent decree, uh, they have asked for modifications to different policies, but not, not to that standard. Uh, Cleveland has had that standard for all uses of force since 2016. Newark, New Jersey has had it since 2017. Uh, the uh, Metropolitan Police Department in Washington, DC has had a, has a, had a necessary, a reasonable, necessary and proportional standard since I think, I think um, at least 2014 and maybe as far back as 2012. Um, there are other agencies that are doing this or that have been switching to the standard um, and they've incorporated into the training. I've seen the Seattle training. It's quite good. Um, and uh, I think there's, you know, it's been road tested for different types of force, both in terms of uh, litigation and in terms of officer discipline. Um, so I think in the process and the development, it's helpful for those who are going to be involved and I hope there's broad involvement in working out the details to communicate with those jurisdictions, ask them how it actually works, ask the police departments, the union and the community, uh, as well as those involved where their consent decrees, ask the monitors, because part of their job under consent decrees is to measure officer performance and to make adjustments to policies where they're either unreasonable or counterproductive. So. I think there, are, there is information out there. I don't have it uh, on hand, but it is out there. And, um, and I think that's worth knowing when you're talking about having a broad standard. Vermont would be joining it, um, you know, progress that's been made in the last half decade, not going out of front uh, of everybody in the country. Thank you very much, helpful. Thank you. Other questions for Julio? Thanks so much, Julio. Um, okay. I think I'm going to go to uh, Gwen Zakoff from the uh, Vermont League of Cities and Towns, if Gwen is available right now. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Okay. Um, hi, this is uh, Gwen Zakoff, uh, Municipal Policy Advocate for the League of Cities and Towns. Thanks for inviting the League to testify on the bill. Um, I think um, I tuned into some of the testimony from last week um, and um, now I'm aware that the 1.2 draft number is what we're working from, so I'll address my comments um, to those um, additions to the um, underlying bill and not repeat a lot of the testimony that's already been given because I think a lot of the testimony that's been given so far um, is well in line with um, the VLCT's policy, um, public safety policy in general. Um, I think the two two um, parts of the um, bill that we probably don't have a position on necessarily only because as I've re been reviewing our policy, we don't have anything with any level of specificity that talks about um, standards for, um, you know, use of force or deadly use of force or those types of things. Um, we just, I couldn't give you an informed position on those. So um, without having our policy committees meet or the board meet or um, uh, having any further review, I'll sort of refrain from those as having sort of a no opinion. Um, but the ones that we um, would like to speak to um, are those that um, are addressed in our policy to some degree. So first off, I overall, I think that uh, it's important to note that um, we fully support this bill, um, the intent of the bill, um, where the bill is heading and um, the uh, league definitely finds it important that um, all of our agencies, um, all of our municipal agencies comply with um, data reporting. Um, the more data, the better the data. Uh, it's, uh, it's only, it, it only helps um, agencies, it only helps um, communities. And um, we are fully behind um, enforcing that standard. So um, we have no concerns with tying in grant funding access to um, complying with those standards. Um, so 
that is uh, the first thing I'd like to point out. The second thing we would like to point out is um, looping in some of the um, comments from the Commissioner of Public Safety, um, Michael Sherling, who had, he had put forth this 10-point proposal um, to the committee. And I think it's important to point out, and not just in terms of data, but sort of everything else that's um, contemplated in the bill, that um, you know the the resources and the um, and the uh, education and the training um, that is available to um, law enforcement officers is absolutely necessary to any level of success um, in moving, as he put it, sort of the ball down the field. And so, um, the more the state um, can step up to help all agencies at the local, county, and obviously the state level the better it is for everybody. Um, and so we fully support um, the um, access, uh, equal access to resources and training and continued access to resource and training um, for um, our law enforcement officers. And in terms of the data, I think um, you know, there has been a proposal and as far as we understand, there is going to be more um, standardization um, of how data tracking is done and there will be um, a apparently a vendor chosen to do an RMS system, to do a, a sort of centralized system for all agencies to use. And we're incredibly thankful for that and very um, hopeful that that comes to fruition sooner rather than later, um, because um, the lack of access to resources for, for certain agencies, depending on size of community um, and um, access is really a, a big hindrance to a lot of um, officers and agencies being able to um, put forth the best data and do the best tracking. Um, so um, we would really like to see the committee take um, a, a look at um, not just that recommendation, but all of the recommendations um, from the um, commissioner. Um, so I think the, the last point I just wanted to bring up was the uh, body camera issue, which I know under the bill is not um, extended to municipal or sheriff um, departments um, and only, I guess, DPS actually. Um, we don't have a, a necessary, necessarily uh, a, a, a league wide uh, position on this, but I can tell you anecdotally, I have not heard a, any opposition to this. I think, by and large, every officer, every chief, and every mayor or city council, whomever um, we've engaged with, um, has. Uh, wants to see body cameras, supports the idea of body cameras, thinks it's really important. But again, going back to being able to um, not only purchase, which is generally the, the, the easiest thing to do when it comes to accessing the actual um, technology, but also um, having the um, continuity of reviewing that um, information for release under the Public Records Act, having the resources available and the manpower um, or woman power to be able to actually review um, the footage and disseminate it in a um, legal manner, as well as continuing to store that data. Um, again, it really depends on from agency to agency how prepared and able they are to uh, meet up meet to that standard. So I think overall, you know, the more the state can do to sort of help, <laughs> you know, make this happen and instead of just putting standards forward and mandates, actually you know, everyone playing as a team and sort of trying to get everyone um, up to the same speed, it's, it's, um, that's going to be the most beneficial um, thing that the, uh, the state can do um, to um, make sure that um, the, these standards, the high standards that we want our officers to um, live up to are actually, actually come to fruition. Um, so I think that's, that, pretty much explains what we wanted to say um, on record. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. I, I would merely point out that um, we're hopeful that the congressional bill will include money for body cameras for local governments. That um, I think it, uh, the one that the policing bill that was being discussed in Washington Hopefully, uh, Representative Welsh will have better news or Rep. Senator Leahy on that front. Um, I don't have any questions. Does anybody else have questions or comments on, from the League? League, uh, thank you so much, Gwen, for taking the time to meet with us this morning. Appreciate it very much. 
Thank um, you very much. I think I'll go to Azana Davis, the executive director of agency of an uh, executive director of racial equity in the agency of I almost promoted you to Secretary of Administration. Oh my goodness. That would be a good job though. Respectfully, sir, please keep that keep it. I can't uh... <laughs> Thank you for joining this morning. Us this morning. Thank you for having me. I apologize for being late and I don't want to repeat um, what was said by other witnesses who I'm sure put whatever I was going to say far more eloquently than I will. So um, if it's all right with you, I would just ask if the committee has a particular question or, or, or particular portion of the bill that you'd like me to address. Um, I think on some of the specific areas are um, what was in the original bill, which is the data collection. And we've heard testimony and I know you've, you've, you've tried to deal with some of the um, different data that's out there. And as, as a member of the working group on justice reinvestment too, you certainly heard the frustration of the justice center in trying to compile data and uh, perhaps a few comments regarding how we could improve that process. Absolutely. So in Vermont, our race data on any topic and in any sector are so fragile because the proportions are so outsized of, of people of color and white Vermonters. You know, I always, I always jokingly use the example, I'm 100% of the Latinos where I live. If I move, that's a 100% <laughs> drop in my household, right? So our data are very fragile for that reason. However, they're immensely important for us to continue collecting because it's gonna help us understand where we are as a baseline and where we intend to go or how soon we can get to where we intend to go. So collection of data is so, so monumentally, race data is so important. And yet, unless we're all doing it and we're all doing it in a unified way where we can um, extrapolate, where the data are transferable and using similar methodologies, unless we're doing all of that and doing it consistently and doing it across the board, it's not gonna move the needle. So universal, or as close as we can get to universal race data collection, particularly with law enforcement is incredibly important. And you know, to the extent that we can incentivize our different agencies around the state to do that, I think it's, it's critical that we do. You mentioned, um, Senator, the, the frustration that we experienced during the justice reinvestment process, because there was so much more we wanted to know and we wanted to dig a lot deeper. And unfortunately, we were often met with the answer that, well, we don't know, or we didn't, we weren't collecting back then, or with an asterisk saying, this might not be accurate, or, you know, 20% of the officers left that one section blank. I'll give perhaps a more, um, a more grim example. Recently, we had difficulty understanding the racial disparities in COVID-19 cases because, we simply weren't publicly reporting those data uh, at the beginning. And even when we were publicly reporting them, the providers, at least initially, had an abysmal collection rate of 27%. They were treating it as optional information. Once we were able to provide guidance to um, the EPI team and to providers to let them know this information was not optional, we, we approached a 100% collection rate. And that's when we were really able to see the racial disparities and act on them as a result. So it really is life or death when we're thinking about who's being stopped, who's being arrested, who's being incarcerated, who's, being, who's getting sick, who's not, and, and where are the patterns where this is happening. Thank you. That's helpful. Senator White has a question. Suzanne, I know, thank you for my, uh, your testimony. I know we've um, kind of talked about this before, but how do we, how do we make sure that um, there are a couple different ways of reporting this data? One is the self-reporting and one is kind of in the eye of the, the person who's doing the, the reporting. And, and I know that there um, is some, I work for public housing authority at certain times uh. and there's, a section there on the application that says that asks for 
um, racial information and it says it's optional. And I know that sometimes people fear filling that in because they fear being discriminated against because they've filled it in. So how do we, how do we um, kind of make sure that, that people are feeling comfortable about doing it and whether it's self-reported or in the eye of the person that's reporting? Yeah, um, you know, there are different, reasonable minds will differ on this one. I am of the belief that race data should be self-reported because particularly, you know, in Vermont, our population, just as an example, our mixed race population is said to increase by over 200% by 2050. It's going to be increasingly difficult for us to look at a person and know accurately that person's racial or ethnic composition. Not only that, I mean, I think it's a bit presumptuous right, of us to, to make that assumption without giving people the agency to self-identify. So personally, I am of the belief that whenever possible, race data should be self-reported. However, you are correct, Senator, in that there are a lot of people who are uncomfortable giving that information over to a system that has historically used it as a, as a weapon against communities. There's a certain guardedness that many people have, and that's something that is our fault as a society. And so I think allowing people the option, as you mentioned, making the information perhaps optional for the person, but explaining to them in very clear and sincere terms, we're asking for this information so that we can check ourselves to make sure that we're not inadvertently or intentionally discriminating against anybody. It's helpful to us, it's helpful to you to provide us with this information, you don't have to, and we'll do our best to fill it in. Um, I suppose what I'm saying in summary is, I believe it should be self-reported whenever possible. However, I also believe that it should be optional and that we should include a disclaimer that lets people know the reason we're asking for that information. And last, if the person still, with that making an informed decision, chooses not to respond, then perhaps we can make it perceived, but with a note, like a checkbox that says, this is perceived or person declined or what have you. That way we'll know what percentage of it is self-reported and what percentage of it is not. But again, I think it's all about letting people make informed decisions for themselves. Other questions on the data issue? I wonder if we could move to the use of force. And uh, there's been some that have um, the use of deadly force, excuse me. Uh, those sections, there have been those who suggested we should wait and study this issue and those who suggested that we forge ahead um, with what's in draft 1.2 on the use of force, but um, with, the, uh, with the understanding that uh, if it's an effective date of say October 1st or even January 1st, uh, that would give time to um, continue to work on the issue. Um, do you have any thoughts about which is the best way to go there or, or whether you should even um, contemplate that without a full study? I am extremely pleased with the enthusiasm that we've seen here and across the country, people wanting to <laughs> enact policy quickly. And I also think that we really want to get it right. And so if more time allows us more opportunity for community feedback and input, if more time allows us to come up with a, a scheme to resource it properly, then I am for more time with the bold-faced caveat that it is not to defer, but rather to perfect or to come as close to that as possible. I also recognize the incredible urgency. Brown bodies have been murdered in the street by the government for so long in this country. This is a matter of urgency. We needed to get this done yesterday, yesteryear, yester century. So all of that said, sir, I am going to punt and tell you that I don't have a firm answer on this. I think that I would rather we do this well than do it too fast. I know that's unsatisfactory as a response, but- No, I, I think it's actually, um, no, 
It's good response. I appreciate and I, and I, that. Thank you. And I just have to say one more thing, you know, um, communities of color, um, women identified communities, pretty much anyone who's ever been systemically marginalized in American society is repeatedly told to wait. Wait for reform, wait for change. It's not the right time. It's not the right administration. It's not the right whatever. We don't have the money. So what I'm saying is not, hey, we want to wait. It's fine. We're cool with that. What I'm saying is we want to get this really right. And that requires however much time it takes. So I just, I had to say that, but um, yeah. I, I appreciate that. I, I think um, it's a, you're, you're absolutely correct. Things, some of these things that are in this bill should have been done years ago. Um, and uh, I take responsibility for what was mine, what wasn't. Um, you know, I've been trying to put into the, uh, I've been responsible on the Senate Appropriations Committee for the state poli police budget for years. And believe me, I've been trying to get body cameras for at least five years. Senator Nika knows she's on the committee with me. And it's been a struggle. And um, unfortunately, it took these incidents to, um, to bring that forward in general agreement on body cameras. Other questions for Rosanna? Thanks so much for joining us. Um, we hope you'll stay involved with our process and uh, continue to work with the committee. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. I think I'm, I'm going to go back to um, our good friend, Eaton um, Nasdan Longo. Did I get it close? Close enough, sir. It's perfectly fine. Um, I. Again, I apologize for, but I'm hearing other people are sort of playing catch up this morning. Um, I am glad that I'm not the only one. I have to say people of color at this moment in the state are much like the um, ugly kid at, the, at high school who suddenly because of some strange magic is now beautiful and has many suitors who all want to go to the prom with them. And so I'm a little confused as to where I'm supposed to be and when and what's going on. And I crave your indulgence on that. Um, I want to say, first off, I'm grateful for how this has morphed in terms of the recognition of the complexities of data collection. Um, that is something that the RDAP certainly put in its report that I forwarded to you last week and that was submitted, of course, in December. Um, and I'm grateful that this has become a more nuanced document in that regard. I echo everything that Executive Director Davis has just said. I think that that is very articulate and very poignant and absolutely on point. And I can say that I believe I have not taken the particular points that she made to the RDAP, but I feel that I can say with very great certainty that people would be completely behind those. Um, I have, I am currently looking at Nouvelle 219 <laughs> or 219 Redux. And the one thing that I would say, and again, I have not had a chance to take this to the RDAP, because um, we met last Tuesday. We'll meet again in July. Um, I want to say that I would really like to hear in particular what Rebecca Turner would have to say about this. She's one of our members, as is Jessica Brown, who is another member, and then certainly Jeffrey Jones. Um, what I would like to forward is some thinking that I've gotten from Rebecca Turner on this that I think is important and I think would stand actually, again, this is my supposition based on uh, familiarity, knowledge of the membership of the panel. Um, and I'm looking at page six, lines eight through 13. Um, the reasonable officer language is again, something that I'm pretty certain the membership of the panel would have some issues about. Um, that 
the notion of reasonable is, shall we say, somewhat fluid, and it really depends on one's subject position. Um, it really entrenches the deferential use of force. Everything can certainly be deemed reasonable from an officer's perspective in the moment. So what would you do with you know, so-called furtive gestures? What does that even mean? Something like hands in pockets, slouching, eye movements, flight, nervousness. I sit as the co-chair of the Fair and Impartial Committee for the Vermont State Police, as well as the chair of the RDAP. And I will tell you, I get very nervous when I'm pulled over. Um, hasn't happened often, I must put that in. But um, I think a lot of us do. I think that nervousness gets interpreted culturally in very different ways. I think that that cultural difference has to be taken into account. I don't see that here. That seems quite dangerous to me. Um, again, uh, where is this taking place? That's also going to influence the definition of of reasonable, are they coming from, are they in an area of known criminal activity? All of these things are not mentioned and yet extraordinarily um, influential in the perception of the idea of reasonable, reasonability, I guess I'd say. Um, so I think what the RDAP would come up with here is that there's really, not a lot here that seems new in terms of use of force. We would very much agree that we need some more time on this. Everything that Director Davis just said is so profoundly true. I have been weeping literally over this. Um, but I think that even though we have been waiting for so many years, and indeed decades, um, there really needs to be some more in here. I was on a call yesterday afternoon with Speaker Johnson, and she related to me that someone in a call the day before that I could not participate in had taken that California um, approach to use of force and completely torn it apart for her in ways that she did not anticipate. I would suggest that those contrary points of view would be very productive for everyone to hear and certainly this committee. Okay. Thank you. Um, do you. Do you have the... Uh... Would love to hear from Rebecca Turner and the two other people you mentioned. Our mm -hmm. time is limited, and I don't know if they would be available tomorrow. But Peggy, if you could give that contact information to Peggy, we can try to get a hold of them. It would be my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, Senator Baruth had a question. I believe he's muted. Sorry, uh, Eitan, you mentioned that in a call with the speaker, someone had torn apart the California uh, structure. C can you give us any more sense of what, what were the objections? I, no, I can't. Um, okay. The phone call was very wide ranging and it had to do with the fact that I wasn't able to be there on Monday because one of my previous dates needed me. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't have the details on that and I, I just, related what I knew, because I think it's important for us all to have these cross-fertilizing conversations. I wish I could tell you more. Thank you. I've just been reminded that we do know Rebecca Turner. I think she was in our committee last year. Um, oh, I'm sure, yes. And has been with us before. And she does work for the Defender Generals. He does. Thank you. Other questions for, yes, Senator White, who's muted also. Yep, thank you. Um, so Eitan, I just wanted to, we had a discussion the other day and I just wanted to get your perception on this because I've been trying to do some research on it. There is, in the bill, it said under color of law. 
and it was brought up that that might at this point be a little incendiary and we should maybe change it to authority of law but i i've been doing some mm. research and color of law is a is a term of art that and yeah. it's widely used in both federal and state uh, and has particular meaning so <laughs> I fear changing that because of the perception. So would you please um, help me out here a little bit? I am a big believer in history. And so what I would suggest is that perhaps you do use the new term and say under authority of law and perhaps in a footnote or in a parenthetical statement say exactly what you just said that this term, which is now kind of, shall we say, <laughs> troublesome, um, refers to this. You're, and that way you're using your language to move things along. So I would suggest that that would be helpful. That you could change it without change. Um, okay, I just, I'm concerned that um, we're, we're changing something that's been in existence for a long time without yeah. um, taking a lot of testimony on what that might mean and the repercussions it might have and unintended consequences. But I think thanks. what I was suggesting was that you could have your cake and eat it too. Well, <laughs> I, I, we could we could try to do that, but I I, I guess I would like um, Senator Sears when we look at this more, I would like some more um, kind of legal um, okay. people to testify on that to see what, yeah, what can, that might be. We get mean. legal people, but we have our own professor of English um, on the committee. Yes, but, but I also would like legal minds to weigh in on that. I understand. Oh, that, I, I'm not sure how to take that, Senator Baruth, but you may respond. I always take it in the most positive way. Um, I guess what I would say is I, I took ATOP to be saying that we would use the new phrase, authority of law, but we would have a definition that made it clear that authority of law is a reference to a standing federal term, color of law, uh, that we had made the decision not to use. Precisely. And, yeah, so it's a, it's a transitional um, thing. Did Julio Correct. want to comment on that? Uh, I would I would just say that I think the legislature has done this plenty of other times when it's changed language in statutes that relate uh, to people who have disabilities that they've updated the language that might have been adopted back in the 1960s or 70s, and um, and some of the in some of those uh, laws that have passed where they changed the terminology, they, they just indicate that there's no departure. Uh, of the standard, um, but it's just updating terminology. So mm -hmm. I think that's that, that's feasible in Ledge Council. I think it'll probably give plenty of examples of that in, in the past um, where they're just updating terminology. Right. They're very helpful. Um, any other comments on the color of law? Zana? If mm -hmm. I could just chime in on this, yeah. I, I agree that uh, we could stand for an update to language, and I appreciate the, the, the senator's raising this because it gets at a deeper issue, which is the way that language colors our perception of, of the world and our understanding of it. I mean, I think, I mean, just parts of regular language, we talk about like master bedroom and master suite, right? Which dates back to slavery and plantations. We talk about um, things being grandfathered in, which is the grandfather clause, right? Which permitted, which was a sneaky way to prohibit newly emancipated enslaved people from voting. We talk about the rule of thumb, which was you could beat your wife with a stick as long as it wasn't wider than your thumb, right? So these are the, the, the ways that language becomes part of our view of the world. And, um, you know, I was told once that in the sciences, we're always taught to question authority and question what we think we know. And we're quick to revise a theory because we're not wedded to the idea, we're wedded to truth wherever that leads us. But in law, we follow precedent so closely and it makes it hard for law to change because we do things the way we've always done them because that's how we've always done them. And this is one really great way that we can update law in a way that's quicker and that's more, um, you know, less adherent to 
tradition and more adherent to just what's right. So for whatever that's worth, I just wanted to add that in. I, I appreciate that for for years. Um, and the, the week school was the reformatory in the ninth from the nineteen early 18 to the 1800s to the 1970 so um, and the week school was closed but it was still in law all over the place um, so, well it's it's a less of an example it's an example of how we do need to frequently update our laws um, I don't know how many people are aware but I was always as chair of this committee um, we've never fixed the bankruptcy laws that allow us to have a yoke two oxen and a bunch of chickens in Vermont <laughs> um, that are not subject to bankruptcy laws. And that goes back to centuries where we, I don't know how many people have a yoke and two oxen anymore on their farm. Can, can I just Senator say that I, I, I appreciate that. Thank I you for starting to... all this. Senator well, no, White. I just wanted to, I just wanted to make sure that we weren't doing something that, but um, so I appreciate the the comments because I felt a little uncomfortable changing it when I looked up the definition and what it was. So I appreciate um, the comments here, and I feel okay. comfortable doing it. I have forgotten. I believe our witness forgot who the witness is. Are there any other questions for Heath? I think it's Heath. Okay. Any more? Any other comments? We appreciate your testimony very much, and the work you're Thank doing. You. The work that you're doing is so important, and we really do appreciate that. And that of all of you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Sheriff Anderson, and then Coach Christie, or Rep. Excuse me, Rep. The Honorable Representative Coach Christie, who would be the next witness after uh, Sheriff Anderson. Sheriff. Uh, welcome to Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Chair, I, I guess I'm not familiar with testifying before this committee, so I'm not sure the flow, and I apologize for being late. I was uh, part of the training council meeting uh, where we were discussing some of these issues. So would you like me to make comments, testify uh, to the- I'd be happy specific. to have you make comments on anything regarding this a uh, particular draft of the bill, which contains data collection, use of force, body cameras, and um, uh, banning of chokeholds, as well as creating a crime for um, restraints involving chokeholds that result in death or serious bodily injury. Very good. I will, uh, I guess for the sake of simplicity, I'll go by the sections in the bill. Uh, uh, the first section regarding uh, tying to grant funding. Uh, I actually wanted to speak about this before uh, the the significant uh, changes to uh, this uh, to this bill uh, in, in support of uh, doing this uh, and some conversations that I've had. Uh, the Sheriff's Association certainly supports uh, participating or uh, supporting this language. Uh, the uh, commentary that I wanted to provide originally was uh, rather simple, and it's simply because of uh, the involvement that I've had in the work to uh, get the, the software and databases uh, to collect this information and be able to provide good data. Uh, Senator White, I believe, has referred to me in this committee as uh, one of the nerds uh, when it comes to data, and uh, I'm a true believer in having uh, objective data that's comparable. I understand the problems of trying to compare apples and oranges. And uh, prior to uh, the race data uh, collection uh, law back in, I think it was 2014, uh, there were so many different standards. Um, so uh, real short, uh, so I don't take up your time because I know you're pressed. Uh, there was some work that was being done by uh, one of the RMS vendors and as you're aware, there's two. Uh, one of them was uh, to essentially automate the process to be able to transmit the uh, collection of race data uh, to the training council's vendor, which is uh, the CRG, uh, uh, CRG research. Uh, so that is supposed to be completed this week. I haven't gotten the email yet saying that it's actually done, uh, but that was work that we had been working on uh, right up into January. Uh, I also like to note that uh, 
while I can't speak for all law enforcement agencies in Vermont and certainly uh, for any that were failing to report, uh, I can speak for several that I worked with who were trying to comply with the standard, but uh, with some technical hurdles, uh, either because of a lack of knowledge on how to use technology or other reasons. Uh, I think it's important to note that uh, of all the agency heads I've spoken with over the years, uh, I haven't found one that was uh, saying they didn't want to comply. Uh, I found several saying they didn't know how to comply or with questions about it. Uh, I'm a firm believer in a, a standard established under uh, traffic safety uh, and how to establish traffic safety, which is that we call it the three E's, uh, education, enforcement, and engineering. Uh, we had a lot of engineering to do because the systems, the computer systems beforehand uh, didn't capture this information and we needed to add that. So I wanted to be clear that uh, at least from my perspective, a lot of people were trying to do the right thing. Uh, and I understand when a rule's made, a law's made, uh, a policy's made, uh, and then people don't follow it, uh, how frustrating that can be. So I, I wanna at least communicate uh, that uh, the, the chiefs, the sheriffs um, do support this language in trying to uh, get to the point where we do uh, deliver equal uh, information uh, that's uh, processable. Uh, it also helps us in trying to deliver information for uh, federal grants that we apply for. Uh, so uh, everything that the federal government generally does is uh, a database. And, uh, this is actually helping us. Uh, and I actually, my personal opinion, going back to the three E's, this is the enforcement piece uh, that has been missing. So I want to thank uh, uh, Senator Baruth for bringing that forward uh, in the original bill. Uh, and uh, just note that our, uh, we do support it. Uh, regarding section uh, section two, I think I basically uh, commit to the same uh, same statement. So I'm just going to go past that. Uh, section three, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, executive director uh, uh, Zuzana, uh, I think she really uh, hit the nail on the head when we talk about. Uh, trying to standardize data and standardize it uh, across uh, across not just law enforcement, uh, but across all entities. The, uh, I guess my request would be that uh, rather than uh, codify in statute what the standard is, uh, codify that the standard, or let me, let me back that up, that we codify what the standard is and use that across all segments of uh, the government. Uh, one problem that we had uh, in trying to develop the race data collection is that we do interface with the Department, uh, Department of Motor Vehicles, a computer in our, our RMS system, our records management system. And in doing so, they define race differently than we originally had started defining race. And so uh, the Department of Motor Vehicles included ethnicity as part of the races, whereas our records management system separated the ethnicity out. And so then we started running into problems where there's 15 different standards for uh, 80 different agencies where we were trying to make that all work. And as one can imagine, that's difficult. So uh, either designating what the standard is and codify that in statute or designate the entity that defines what that is, wherever that fits in, in the government. Um, I think that that would be important. So everybody can turn to that one de definition when we talk about something uh, such as race or ethnicity, uh, there's also a problem is that uh, we interface, uh, all Vermont law enforcement interfaces with the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigations through what's known as NIBRS. Uh, and if there's any questions about what NIBRS is, I'm happy to talk about that, but I assume it's been discussed here. Uh, and the FBI has its own set of definitions of what race is and ethnicity is that we have to comply with to, to comply with the FBI standards. So it becomes a, a frustrating problem, uh, not just for for us, but also for uh, the vendors that we, we select to develop the software to support us when we need to uh, try and take square pegs, round pegs, star pegs, and get them to come out the other side as being uh, just one uh, discrete message. Uh, regarding uh, section Uh, section three, uh, and I don't have, uh, I'll say I don't have uh, a piece in this, but I'm aware of the knowledge. Uh, CRG, who is currently de the designated vendor for the council, uh, they uh, are trying to work with the administration to actually store 
all the data under the, the data.vermont.gov domain where uh, the state has all of its uh, publicly, uh, uh, public, publicly shared data. I don't know the process for that, but just want to be, uh, want the committee to be aware that that's something that's being looked at to increase access to this information. Uh, and then uh, going to uh, subsection five, uh, where we, uh, where it, I'm sorry. Subsection uh, five, uh, regarding the collection of force data on motor vehicle stops. Again, I just ask that a standard be set uh, that we codify uh, what force uh, is being used. I'll speak more to, uh, to the use of force conversation later on, but in short that we just codify what levels that we are reporting, what we want to know, uh, rather than uh, speak to specific techniques per se, speak to specific categories, uh, because uh, as I've mentioned in, uh, in the government operations committee, uh, we define force beginning at the very presence of law enforcement. Uh, we believe that uh, the office, the, the uniform, that all uh, has an effect. And as the committee has heard today, a, a testimony of, of, uh, of Eton being stopped, um, he gets nervous and well, there's a, there's a reason for that and presence is in its own nature of force. So I don't think we need to capture every time we're present on a car stop because obviously if we, we issued a ticket or a warning that defines presence, but then where are those lines? Uh, so a discussion surrounding that I think would be important um, and I'd be happy to offer language uh, or suggested categories if uh, the committee would like that. Uh, with regards to section four, uh, uh, I agree with Julio uh, regarding uh, not just capturing use of deadly force, but capturing the use of force, including lethal and non-lethal. Uh, I also echo uh, similar uh, concerns uh, regarding uh, the uh, period of time on uh, on how uh, in, uh, improper force could be used or improper restraint could be used. Um, a mere uh, glancing uh, touch of a neck could be construed to be a 20 year felony, which uh, I think would then uh, create an adverse effect, especially in law enforcement where uh, we see uh, a backing away from intervention as opposed to engaging because uh, police officers across the state would ultimately say it's not worth arresting someone where I have no penalty to act uh, if there's even a mere possibility that uh, I could be arrested uh, for doing that. Uh, I don't think that that's the intent. I, uh, I think that there's been a lot of passionate statements uh, about what we are trying to prevent here. Uh, and I also want to uh, uh, reinforce that uh, Strangulation has long been recognized under Vermont statute, uh, under uh, specifically under aggravated assault uh, and or under the homicide statutes. And with that, we have case law that supports it. Uh, we recognize what it is. Uh, Vermont law enforcement is not trained uh, in the either the level two or the level three uh, non-lethal use of force classes on any sort of chokehold or restraint. Uh, the, in fact, I spoke with uh, Sheriff Hill, who was in the 1985 Police Academy, who said uh, that they were teaching it at that point, and then uh, halfway through his class, they entered in and said, we no longer teach uh, choke culture or uh, neck restraints. So this has been uh, out of the, the mainstream training uh, in Vermont uh, for an ex uh, several decades. Uh, as to whether other agencies do uh, provide that training or not, I, I can't speak to that. My agency does not. Uh, my concern, however, uh, with the language uh, also goes to uh, what I think the goal is to prevent as people dying uh, from a, a neck restraint. And my concern is, is that if a police officer is being strangled um, and they're uh, effectively, uh, we'll say the crime of aggravated assault or attempted homicide or whatever that legal standard may be, their, and their only uh, two options are to either strangle the person back or shoot them, what is a, a preferred option? Um, I feel that uh, deadly force is a uh, well, uh, well-defined standard uh, in, the, uh, in the United States, both at the Supreme Court level, as well as in the state of Vermont and what is permitted and not permitted. Uh, there's uh, legal minds in this room that uh, I think could speak to the, those instances far better than I can. Uh, but 
trying to uh, completely revamp uh, a system that is codified and uh, through precedence uh, then leads to lots of questions and what the secondary, tertiary, and quaternary effects can be. Um, I, I offer to uh, improve the system. We recognize that there are problems. Uh, we need to do that, which is why the Sheriff's Association, the Chief's Association, the Department of Public Safety, and the Training Council are meeting frequently to say, how do we fix this? We need to fix this. We recognize that there's things that are wrong. Uh, and uh, as many of you know, most of those organizations generally are, uh, are like hoarding cats uh, or herding cats, excuse me. Um, so that the cats are facing in the same direction and going in that direction alone, I think that that's a remarkable statement uh, that we recognize the issues and, and we have to own that. Uh, I would offer if the current uh, language stands as is um, that we consider sustained pressure because again, it's uh, the interruption of a person's breathing that uh, leads to uh, issues with that, uh, with uh, their ability to live. Um, I also would uh, encourage that we consider uh, not necessarily eliminating the language, but eliminating the crime and saying that uh, it falls into the language of the already uh, established standard of aggravate, uh, aggravated assault and or homicide uh, complement it. I think it uh, does two things. It doesn't create uh, the issues that uh, Pepper was discussing, uh, or I should say the additional work that Pepper was discussing, but it does, uh, as Senator Baruth mentioned, it does codify that we recognize that this is a problem that we need to speak to specifically, uh, that does speak to law enforcement and does say to law enforcement, this is not okay, we do not do this, and if you do do this, this is the penalty that you're looking to face. Uh, my concern is, uh, the language a law enforcement officer shall not use an improper restraint on any person for any reason. Uh, the Another concern with that is what if an attempted uh, and trained technique, a proper technique uh, were affected, but then, uh, then effectively done improperly. And I think that's what Senator Benning was mentioning uh, is what happens if we try to do something and it goes wrong. Um, and that does happen. Well, uh, I, I just, I, I need to point out, I'm sorry, but, um, you know, people that work in group homes around the country have been arrested, charged with murder for improper restraint. Um, so I, I don't think this is a new um, idea. Um, we've heard of incidents throughout, whether that was an intent to provide an in, improper restraint or not, I don't know, but there's enough of those cases that have happened um, that I don't know why uh, we should treat law enforcement any different they're supposed to be trained in proper restraint methods. Uh, so the, uh, in response to that, uh, Senator, I, uh, uh, I can give you anecdotal stories. Um, I'm trained to perform what we know as a uh, armbar takedown. And on, on one instance, I attempted to perform that, but because of the resistance, instead of performing an armbar takedown, I was flung through the railing of, of a deck. Had that changed because the person was uh, fighting with me, uh, had that changed and instead of performing an armbar uh, takedown, I twisted the arm the wrong way out of a loss of balance, then things like that. Uh, so those are the concerns that uh, have been raised to me. Uh, it's I offer as a- I appreciate that, but I didn't see much sympathy for those folks. <laughs> Senator Benning. It's easy to look in hindsight <clears throat> and say, this is what happened that shouldn't happen. <clears throat> but Dick, using your earlier analogy of the gentleman who was killed after being initially stopped, he was actually asleep in his car at the Wendy's drive through If you walk through from the beginning of that situation, we as a legislature have determined that for someone to be convicted of a DUI, there has to be a breath test that's not just a preliminary breath test, but a data master test, which is used as evidence. So if you walk from the beginning of that stop all through that process, 
is there an ability on the part of law enforcement to use force at some point during that period between when the individual is first rolling down the window in the car and when they hopefully eventually get to a barracks to take the test? I've heard a lot of people suggest that this crime doesn't rise to the level of deadly force. I will agree with that. I've heard a lot of people say that the officer had an alternative. He could have just simply let him go because he had the car and he had his license and registration. But the officer all of a sudden doesn't have the ability to follow through on the process of the crime. Now, I'm a defense attorney. Frankly, I don't like when people get convicted of crimes. That's just my nature. But if I'm looking at it from the officer's point of view, if we expect them to only be able to convict somebody of that DUI by getting them to the barracks and having a data master test taken, at what point in that process should we say the officer is allowed to use force? And how do you identify at what point in time that force becomes overbearing to the point where we say, no, you just can't go that far? I don't know how to get to the answer to that question, frankly, but this is all part of the conversation. And what I don't want to see us do is get to a point where we are depriving officers of the ability to follow through on what we expect them to do by going to the end point and looking back in time and saying, this shouldn't have been the end result. We don't want the end result, but how do you get from point A when the car window is being rolled down through to a point where an arrest can actually happen and somebody can be prosecuted in the manner in which we, as a legislature, expect that to happen. I think the, the, the pro, well, I appreciate that, Joe, and, and time doesn't allow me to continue to debate this, but um, I'd like to complete the, um, with the witness we, um, but I will say, I'm looking back at the number of cases over the years where people in other functions, we have a court ruling regarding Woodside and the use of restraint. While it was not a chokehold, they were deemed to be improper restraints by staff at Woodside. The court ordered a cease and desist. The court ordered um, no longer certain classifications of people could be held, kids could be held at Woodside anymore because of the improper use of restraint. So we have examples where courts right here in Vermont have ruled on improper restraint. Why, and my only question to uh, Sheriff Anderson really was, why should law enforcement be under any different standard than other people who are forced to provide restraint? All of that can be questioned. But if you read Judge, uh, Judge Crawford's federal court ruling on the Woodside, clearly um, we have an example there. I don't know if that was racially motivated or not. I don't remember the details of it, um, but. Um, uh, I'd be happy to speak uh, briefly, Senator. I don't have, I, I really, I need to move on. Um, and because uh, I, I want to make sure we hear from Coach Christie. Um, if, if we could, if uh, Senator Baruth and Senator White, um, and then we'll hopefully move on to uh, other issues that uh, Sheriff Anderson has. Well, I'll, I'll hold uh, for time. Senator White. Yeah, I, I just would like to um, not right now, but follow up on um, the where the line is on the use of force, because as as Sheriff said, the in their training, they consider just the mere presence of a uniform and a police car as a use of force. So when we're talking about appropriate use of force, I, I think that we need to do a little more investigating on that. And I know he said he had some language that he could give us and not right now, but maybe he can write that down and send it to us and we can look at it. That'd be helpful. Sheriff, please go ahead. Whoop. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so uh, very quickly, uh, to answer your question uh, regarding the, the Woodside uh, restraint, uh, from my understanding of what happened, uh, 
that's not trained and that's not a permitted restraint uh, in uh, law enforcement teaching. Uh, Woodside has personnel that are not trained by uh, the uh, Criminal Justice Training Council's curriculum, as far as I understand it. So I don't know how those people were trained. Uh, but what I do know is that uh, what was uh, what restraint was done there uh, was not uh, something that falls within our our training model. The uh, second piece is uh, in response oh, yep. to why law enforcement yeah. should be able to or why there should be a different standard uh, is because by the very nature of law enforcement, it it's the only a government entity that is empowered to take away a person's uh, ability to physically move. Uh, we don't have a citizen's arrest statute. We don't have uh, we don't have an organization that uh, removes people from a crime or from a, a violent scene or uh, a person who's experiencing a mental health uh, a crisis and needs uh, to be secured for their own safety. Uh, so there's a different level of of need. Um, but that being said, you're not going to hear from us that we feel that there should be uh, inappropriate restraint or inappropriate conduct. Uh, our goal is to uh, establish safety and establish trust. It's not to uh, serve as the, the executioner. It's not to be the punishment. It's not to, to teach people why they don't break the law. We're the entrance into the criminal justice system. We're not the criminal justice system. Appreciate that. Uh, Senator Sears, I, I understand uh, you have more witnesses. I just have two brief comments to add on Please. body cameras Please. and under color yep. of law. Uh, with regards under, may, may I continue? Yeah, please do. Well, with regards to under color of law, uh, I reached out to Senator White because, uh, not because I'm uh, connected with the phrase itself, but rather because uh, I understand under the federal statutes the effect of that language and my concern uh, or what I am married to is that that punishment, that consequence, that enforcement uh, be preserved. And so hearing from uh, Julio today on his, his view of that, I'm, I'm more than happily content. Uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, under the Michigan Law Review, they define it as unauthorized indeed and grossly illegal conduct. And so that's what whatever phrase we want to attach to it. Um, that's what we're really trying to define. And however that, that happens from the perspective of law enforcement, we want to ensure that that's preserved. Uh, the, uh, beyond that, I'm not an attorney and don't, will never uh, claim to try and offer the language in that regard. Uh, I see Julio turned on his camera. I don't know if he wanted to speak to that. I'm sorry, did you say, you referred to the Michigan Law Review? Uh, yes, sir. Did you, can you give the citation that like the volume and year if you have it? Uh, I have a link, which I will uh, post. Okay, the just forward it to me. That's all. That's all. I just wanted to see it. That's all. Okay. You had another point you wanted to make. Uh, and with regards to body cameras, I believe it's been mentioned, but uh, I spoke with uh, the sheriffs. Uh, my agency does use body cameras. Lamoille County uses body cameras. The other ones haven't identified a funding source uh, to be able to get them. It's not only the upfront cost, but it's also the storage cost. Uh, and then there's also uh, some uh, concerns regarding uh, the Public Records Act uh, and the release of information from those. Uh, under our current interpretation, I say uh, the Wyndham County Sheriff's Department's current interpretation, it's incredibly permissive. Uh, and my only concern with that is that we do get invited into, uh, into people's uh, homes. We get invited into uh, some of the worst moments in people's lives. Uh, where those, uh, those recordings can be uh, used for a variety of reasons, uh, which we don't get to discern any sort of, uh, any sort of intent. Uh, for example, I just received a, a public records request for uh, video recordings of a person with a mental health crisis uh, with whom I have personal knowledge that there's a divorce proceeding going on and how those could be used could be could be for uh, completely reasonable reasons. They could also be used to the detriment of one party or the other uh, for something that happened two years ago. Uh, so I, I would ask that the committee at some point, sometime in the future next year, whenever that may be, but they consider the effects of uh, public records requests on these. I think that there's a need for public access to recordings. I think that there's a need for accountability. Uh, just how that happens, I think there needs to be discussion. Actually, we did pass a bill a few years back on body cameras in the 
it. And it probably should be updated and reviewed um, once again uh, on how the story, I agree um, that it is a, the public records aspect is a problem. I remember discussing that we had a number of body camera footage where an officer had felt the need to turn it off when he went into somebody's home where there was domestic violence and he was interviewing the victim um, for a number of reasons um, felt that was necessary. So we did discuss all that in that bill. And I, um, at some point, Bryn, maybe they, the law that we currently have should be um, somehow referenced in the body camera section. So the people are aware that there's a law there already on body cameras. And I think if I, could, if I could just add, if Bryn's going to be looking into that, when they are dealing with a confidential informant in any kind of a case, I'm wondering if uh, they have a body camera that's on full time, whether that, that would a, be... I, uh, I think that was one problem. of the places we exempted the... But I don't remember. Okay. We had a number of exemptions. Um, uh, other questions for Sheriff Anderson? Sheriff, a pleasure to meet you and uh, thank you for your testimony. And I'm sure you'll continue to work with Senator White on some of the data collection that is more into the Government Operations Committee than Senate Judiciary, luckily. Absolutely. And uh, thank you for the time. Uh, and I appreciate the work that you are doing. Thank you. Thank you. We now have uh, Coach um, Kevin Christie, whom uh, all of us know as a representative from, uh, God, I shouldn't have mentioned from where, um, I forgot <laughs> the town, uh, Coach. It's but um, Coach is also the head of the Social Equity Caucus uh, of the legislature and has been obviously active in a lot of these bills. I've, we've worked closely together over the years on a number of initiatives. So we're pleased that you could take time away from your schedule to meet with us today, Coach. Well, uh, thank you very much, um, Senator. Uh, and uh, our colleagues, uh, allies, and friends. Um, I, this has been an emotional time, as you can all imagine, and have felt at different levels. Uh, but for me personally, it's, uh, it hasn't been easy uh, to do our work and just be a human being during this time. Um, you know, being a black man and watching another black man killed and then another one, you know, following, you know, very shortly after, uh, knowing full well that race was in, in, intrinsic in that in that process you know, so uh it it just hasn't been easy and then the uproar uh, that resulted uh just brought back a, a lot of memories uh, you know of the 60s and just every day uh, so i'll i'll try to set that um you know, at a level and, and move forward with some of my thinking uh, regarding uh, this look at law enforcement at this time. So I didn't put it in my testimony, but I, I wanted to start with a couple of questions and we don't have to answer those, but I want you to keep them in mind as I present you know, my, my thoughts. So one question is, would you send your child or family member to a non-accredited hospital? 
would you send a child or a family member to a non-accredited school? So what this does is it brings me to uh, uh, this. When we look at a shift in paradigm, uh, education and training across disciplines throughout my career, we have always spoken to utilizing best practice. Best practices are the cornerstone of continuous improvement. Another concept to be applied is we don't have to reinvent the wheel. This brings up the results of my research and observations. A high quality research based policing system that embodies our aspirations. The 21st century policing task force construct. In addition, we are challenged in our legislative mandate to assure quality, transparency, and accountability. The tool that is used across disciplines and institutions is accreditation. The crown jewel of law enforcement accreditation is CALEA, the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies. The pillars of 21st century policing are building trust and legitimacy, policy and oversight, technology and social media, community policing and crime reduction, training and education, and officer safety and wellness. They reviewed five ways stakeholder groups can implement the task force recommendations. Local government would create listening opportunities with the community, allocate government resources to implementation, conduct community surveys on attitudes towards policing and publish results, define the terms of civilian oversight to meet the community's needs, they would recognize and address holistically the root causes of crime. Law enforcement would review and update its policies, training, and data collection. Sounds familiar? On use of force and engage community members and police labor unions in the process. It would increase transparency of data policies, and procedures. Call on the post commission to implement all levels of training, examine hiring practices and ways to involve the community in recruiting, and ensure officers ha have access to tools they need to keep them safe. Communities, on the other hand, would engage with local law enforcement participate in meetings, surveys, and other activities, participate in problem-solving efforts to reduce crime and improve quality of life, work with local law enforcement to ensure crime-reducing resources and tactics are being deployed that mitigate unintended consequences, call on state legislatures to ensure the legal framework does not impede accountability of law enforcement. And lastly, review school, school policies and practices and advocate for early intervention strategies that minimize involvement of youth in criminal justice systems. A reference, the, the Post Commission, that's Peace Officer Standards and Training. Uh, to explain CALEA, uh, CALEA accreditation programs provide public safety agencies with an opportunity to voluntarily meet an established set of professional standards, which require comprehensive and uniform written directives that clearly define authority, performance, and responsibility. 
reports and analyzes analysis to make fact-based and informed manif- management decisions, preparedness to address natural and man-made critical incidences, community relationship building, and met- maintenance independent review by subject matter experts, continuous pursuit of excellence through annual reviews and other assessment measures. Uh, I did provide uh, two links uh, in the uh, uh, in my testimony for you that gives you, I mean, incredible amount of information from those two sources. Uh, the uh, U.S. Department of Justice uh, final report on 21st century policing, and then uh, Kalia's uh, website. What I'm proposing uh, is that we create an omnibus, omnibus law enforcement reform bill. This when I say all, it means all law enforcement agencies across the spectrum. Uh, use of force, uh, we would uh, define as necessary and require necess- necessary consistently uh, across all law enforcement, including uh, the sections three, four, and five of Ms. Uh, Boryang's testimony that she gave. Uh, I, I support uh, her position, you know, there. Uh, in addition to adop- adopting the pillars of 21st century policing, we would adopt accreditation. It is required in statute across many institutions already. We do it in education, we do it in healthcare. We do it in human services, including providers and facilities. So both the providers and the institutions are accredited. Um, Of our institutions, which one does not? Law enforcement. We don't have standards across the board in statute that we said that they will attain. CALEA, the Commission on Accreditation Law Enforcement Agencies, we could require that accreditation. There are levels of accreditation and self-study preparation uh, is the time span for doing the work of compliance. We would give a time frame to complete the self-study in order to not lose certifications uh, and funding, Uh, I I didn't put that, but that would be uh, an option for us. Uh, And this would allow all agencies, regardless of size, to move in that direction. Uh, The work of uh, self-study is timely. And if done well, Uh, it can take up to five years to get through your self-study. To be engaged and on track for completion of the self-study, we, it's verifiable through uh, the agency process. We did this in Title 16. Uh, Those of us that remember about 24 years ago, uh, we did it for tech centers. Because up to that point, tech centers were not accredited. So by statute, we said we will ensure that tech centers were accredited. And over a period of about four years, we were able to get everybody into the queue for self-study and then eventual uh, accreditation. Uh, The next piece would be uh, looking at Act 54. The act that was related to racial disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice Advisory Council, we would amend uh, the oversight within the act to include 
the racial equity executive director to the council. Um, regarding Act 9, uh, the racial equity executive director, uh, we would amend to add original language back into the bill that was dropped. And this would give us an additional layer of, um, of transparency and accountability by putting subpoena power back in the hands of the executive director of racial equity to aid in the work of mitigating systemic racism across all entities of state government. We would look at what's in H-478, establishing a task force to study and consider a state apology and proposal for reparations for the institution of slavery. Accreditation for communications. One of the other things that uh, Kalia uh, offers is accreditation for like the 911 systems, the call centers, uh, and uh, law enforcement communication entities. Uh, moving to the training council, uh, the thought would be to move the training council to the Department of Public Safety with, legislat with legislative oversight combined with both House and Senate GovOps and Judiciary Committees. Uh, two pledges. In August, when we reconvene, to look at adding support to the Office of Racial Equity uh, with a data analyst and a policy analyst. If we look at all of the work we as a legislator, legislature have added to that entity, it, it, it's, it, it's self-explanatory in, in the request. Uh, the other one would be the pledge in August to add body cameras to all of our law enforcement entities across the board where they do not exist at present. Those of us that have been trying to work on body cameras uh, over the, the years, and we got the report from um, Commissioner Sherling himself, where he said they had the money in the budget for the cameras, the actual physical cameras. The problem came in storage. Uh, just as the sheriff mentioned, you know, before me. Where the sea change has come in the last couple of years is with the data farms that have been increasing quantumly across the country and the world. The price of data storage has gone down, you know, almost uh, the cost has become viable, and that's why when we were putting our CARES package together, uh, Commissioner Sherling said that he felt that he had enough in his budget now to make it happen. Um, so I, I think our work when we come back, that would make sense. So in closing, back to the, my first two questions <laughs> about accreditation, right? Why wouldn't we uh, move in that direction? Uh, these are all research-based. Uh, it's, it's interesting that the 21st century uh, policing uh, task force report was completed in 2016. Up to that point, it was back in the 60s during the Johnson administration that 
the federal government did its last task force on law enforcement. There was that span of time between Johnson and the Obama administration that that had been looked at at a federal level. Those reports and the task force itself, some of the best law enforcement minds in the country and the world actually, because they had the international associations involved as well, were part of that process. It's research-based, it's been followed since its inception, and one evidentiary piece that I'll, I'll share with you, if you watched the news at any point about the riots and the protest, there was a distinct difference from community to community. And what I gleaned from that after the emotional part was the difference. We saw law enforcement with helmets, shields, sticks, tear gas. Then we saw law enforcement with arm in arm, taking a knee with protesters. What you will see now is, is that those agencies that were hand in hand and taking the knee were agencies that have already moved to 21st century policing and CALEA accreditation. Those other agencies are still old school and working on old pretext. So that is basically my, uh, my testimony at this time. And, and it's not, you know, let, it's not throwing anything out. If anything, it's offering research-based supports to a new paradigm for Vermont law enforcement. Well, I want to thank you, Coach, for your thoughtful and uh, testimony. And I followed your um, testimony uh, that you've written down. Hope to have time to go to the links um, that you've provided. Certainly your final point about the different law enforcement agencies and how they um, responded to protests and other behaviors is well taken. Um, one of the things that appears in the in my local community, the Bennington. You're, you're muted, Senator Sears. Somehow. I shouldn't be muted. I hear him. I hear him. Um, can you hear me? Can't. Um, yes. One of the things in my local community, in the report from the uh, Chiefs of Police Association mm. regarding the Bennington React, you know. Uh, the Bennington Police Department mm -hmm. was the warrior mentality that was throughout mm -hmm. the um, department. And I think that that particular point you just made really hits home to me because that's where I think in many ways the gathering of all this equipment that was made available through the federal government, a surplus military equipment to our mm -hmm. local police force in many ways militarized those police departments from a community policing model, um, which has built uh, significant changes too. I think we all agree. However, um, this militarization of local police departments and that impact on particularly uh, minority groups uh, is I think at the heart of part of this problem. And you, you really touch on that through the accreditation process as well as your other comments. So I think it's well taken. Uh, th thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I think one um, 
other thought in in what you were uh, mentioning about that, uh, you know, just process. Um, I, I'm I'm really uh, taken uh, by the moment. You know, we 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 have an opportunity, I think, to to look at the whole picture. I, I will share one other piece of information about accreditation. There are only two, we have what, approximately 75 law enforcement Somewhere in that area. You know, entities. Of that number, only two are accredited in our state. DSP being the state police and UVM police. And there's one that's in self-study, which is Hartford. And it's been, it's almost in its fifth year of self-study. The UVM uh, campus security police department are not at the top tier of accreditation. They are, I think a level two or a level three, there's five levels of accreditation. And I'm not sure where the state police are, but they're not at the very top, but they are an accredited agency as well. So, that's the rest of the story about accreditation. But, you know, I, I, I think that, well, I, 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 I won't be beat up that. Uh, if you have a chance to visit, you know, the report, you'll see. We will. Uh, Senator Benning, and I want, want to mention that Senator Benning is a former chair of the Human Rights Commission, who will now be asking a question of the current chair of the Human Rights Commission. <laughs> Yes, and it, it, for me, this is the most important question of the immediate moment, because coach, you're a difficult guy to get a hold of. Were you expecting me to make the reservation on Saturday, or were you making the reservation on Saturday for our lunch? Uh, I'll do that. <laughs> uh, I'll be doing that for us. I'm well, very I much looking now. forward to it. Uh, that may be a good place to end this meeting, unless there are <laughs> other questions. But I'm glad that you're all having lunch together. <laughs> <laughs> be Reminder, fun. we're meeting at nine tomorrow. Right. Yes. Thank you, Peggy. Uh, the committee meeting will actually start at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Senator Nitka will be chairing the committee. I'll be on the road to Albany, New York, but we'll be hopefully listening in mm -hmm. with our wonderful cell phone, phone service between Bennington, Vermont, and Albany, New York. Mm -hmm. Senator White. Thank you, um, Senator Sears. Do, is, do we have a meeting at noon? Yes, we do. The caucus is already on. We're supposed to be jumping on. I know, but I thought there was also a conference committee at noon. Today's uh, Wednesday. That, that, that didn't happen. Not, we did not oh. get the House um, okay. has not responded yet to our noontime meeting. Okay. I was not aware there's a noontime caucus. Yeah, at 12 o'clock. Yeah, oh, we're actually great. supposed to be signed on right now. Yeah. Well, I'm. Uh, thank you very much. I guess we'll adjourn this meeting so those of you who want to be in the caucus can join the caucus.